Hi there, welcome back to this video on reading and annotating Romeo and Juliet for GCSE. This video is going to be looking at Act 2, Scene 4. So last time we read in Act 2, Scene 3, we saw Romeo convincing Friar Lawrence um, to marry him and Juliet together. And we end with this caution from the Friar that wise and slow they stumble that run fast. So this idea that you know we've got to take things slowly and not rush into things perhaps. So scene four then, Verona, a street. Enter Benvolio and Mercutio. Where the devil should this Romeo be? Came he not home tonight? Not to his father's, I spoke with his man. Why that same pale-hearted wench, that Rosaline, torments him so that he will sure run mad? So they're questioning where Romeo is, and we know that he's with the friar, because we've just read this in Act 2, Scene 3. And they're still thinking about Romeo's relationship with Rosaline at this point, so they're not entirely aware of what's been happening with Juliet. Tybalt, the kinsman to old Capulet, hath sent a letter to his father's house, a challenge on my life. Romeo will answer it. So here we've got a bit of a plot point. And this entire scene really is to tell us, it's a little bit of a filler scene and it tells us a lot about the plot and it drives kind of some of the action in the play. Um, so we're only going to go through it really quickly really and pick out key plot points. So here we learn that Tybalt wants to challenge Romeo to a duel and has sent a letter to the... Um, to the Montague house challenging Romeo and Benvolio states that Romeo will answer the challenge. Mercutio, any man that can write may answer a letter. Nay, he will answer the letter's master, how he dares being dared. Alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead, stabbed with a white wench's black eye, run through the ear with a love song, the very pin of his heart cleft with the blind bow boy's butt shaft and he is a man to encounter Tybalt. So here we get this idea that Romeo is already dead because he is in love, that Rome, Mercutio suggests, but also that he is weak because he is in love. He questions if he is a man to encounter Tybalt because he is so in love. Benbo, Benvolio, why? What is Tybalt? More than a prince of cats. Oh, he's the courageous captain of compliments. He fights as you sing prick song, keeps time, distance and proportion. He rests if men in rest. One, two, and third in your bosom, the very butcher of a silk button, a duelist, a duelist, a gentleman of the very first house, of the first and second, and it goes on on the next page. But here we learn this kind of beautiful, kind of fluid dancer imagery to describe Tybalt's fighting style, which kind of poses him as a little bit of a threat, really. This builds tension for us as the audience because we know that Tybalt's going to fight Romeo and we know that Benvolio has stated that Romeo will answer this challenge. So it builds a little bit of tension for us because we can see that Romeo is going to be up against this quite challenging competitor. First and second cause. Ah, the immortal Posado, the punto reverso, the hay. The what? The pox of such antic lipsing affecting fan... To signs. These new turners of accent. By Jesus, a very good blade, a very tall man, a very good haw. Why is this not a lamentable thing, grandsire, that we should be thus afflicted with these strange flies, these fashion mongers, these pardon me's, who stand so much on the new form that they cannot sit at ease on the old bench? Oh, their bones, their bones. So, here what we need to learn about Mercutio is that he's speaking in prose at this point. And in a Shakespeare play, we may have discussed this before, but we see verse, poetic verse is often used to show that things are more important or things that are higher class. Prose is used um, to show that things are kind of less important and maybe lower in class and importance there as well. So we get this impression that everything that Mercutio is saying here is kind of, it's kind of low level, it's banter, it's unimportant really perhaps. And all we need to know about this is that Mercutio is it, it's, it's banter. He's kind of entertaining again in, in describing Tybalt. Benvolio, here comes Romeo, here comes Romeo. Without his row like a dried herring. Oh, flesh, flesh, how thou, art thou fishified? Now he is for the numbers that Petrarch flowed in. Laura to his lady was a kitchen wench. Mary, she had a better love to be Rhymer. Dido a dowry, Cleopatra a gypsy. Helen and hero, hidings and harlots. This be a grey eye or so, but not to the, but not to the purpose. Signor Romeo, bonjour. There's a French salutation to your French slop. You gave us the counterfeit fairly last night. 
These long kind of rambling and alliterative sentences that Mercutio um, speaks in show his, um, his kind of excitement. We can add a note to that effect. We could say it create an, an energetic tone to his words. And Romeo replies, good morrow to you both. What counterfeit did I give you? Um, so here he's kind of saying, you know, where did you go last night? If we think back to Act 2, Scene 1, when Mercutio and Benvolio are looking for Romeo outside the Capula Orchard. And he was with Juliet, wasn't he? And um, so now they're kind of asking, where, where were you? You kind of slipped off. But Romeo here, interestingly, replies in prose. Romeo usually speaks in verse in the play to show that he's kind of a higher status character. But here he responds in prose. So we get this idea that all of this conversation is kind of generic kind of chit-chat. And it's banter. The slip, sir, the slip. Can you not conceive? Pardon, good Mercutio. My business was great. And in such a case as mine, a man may strain courtesy. There's as much to say such a case as yours constrains to man to bow that constrains a man to bow in the hands, meaning to curtsy, thou hast most kindly hit it. A most courteous exposition. Nay, I am the very pink of courtesy. Pink for flower, right. Why then my pump is well flowered. Sure wit, follow me this jest now till thou hast worn out thy pump, that when the single soul of it is worn, the jest may remain after the wearing solely singular. But the jesting here. Um, the kind of, maybe... A little bit of kind of a sexual idea about what Romeo's been up to last night, but the important thing to take is that it's light hearted banter. So we can add that it's light hearted kind of conversation here. Oh, single soul dress solely, singular for the singleness. We've got lots of kind of puns and language play down here. Come between us, good Benvolio, my wits faint. Swits and spurs, swits and spurs are all crying match. So we've got this idea, you know, it's just a friendly conversation. And another scene where Mercutio leads as an entertaining and comedic behaviour as well. So we, we can use this scene to kind of evidence what we already know about Mercutio and kind of intensify that, that he's light-hearted and he's energetic. We continue down this page with more banter. They are in good and high spirits. So we see kind of a lot of conversation that goes on here and all we really need to know is that you know it's a, a energetic conversation it's positive we're supposed to feel kind of energized and enlightened by the chat even if we don't necessarily understand all of the kind of punts and jokes that are going on it's important that we understand that they are in high spirits we're not going to read through this bit because here we've got the next bit the nurse enters and her man peter now if we think back we know that the nurse is coming to look for romeo to discuss um the the wedding plans Juliet sent him sent her sorry to find Romeo um as she said that you know if you're serious about me in act two scene two then you'll 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 marry me so the nurse enters a sail a sail Mercutio two two a shirt and a smock so what we've got here is Romeo is mocking the nurse by maybe suggesting that she's like a ship coming towards them on the horizon as she enters and maybe that she you know she's kind of kind of big and overdressed so he might you know he might be commenting on her figure there a little bit or the clothes that she's wearing but we know that he's kind of taking the mick out of her peter anon my fan peter so she's kind of a little bit hot she's a bit sweaty she's fanning herself with this big fan that peter's holding for her and Mercutio says good peter to hide her face for her fans the fairer face so we've got this idea that Mercutio, again, the entertainer, is mocking the nurse and saying that the fan is prettier, a better face than, than hers, and to cover it up. Not forgetting, they don't know the nurse at this point, so we could see this as maybe quite cruel behaviour. But again, they're kind of, you know, all the boys together kind of having a laugh. God ye good morrow, gentlemen. God ye good den, fair gentlewoman. Is it good den? Being in kind of good day. "'Tis no less, I tell you, for the bawdy hand of the dial is now upon the prick of noon. "'Out upon you, what a man are you? "'One gentleman, and that God hath made himself to mar. 
By my troth, it is well said for himself to mark, quoth I. Gentlemen, can any of you tell me where I may find the young Romeo to discuss this proposal? So she doesn't know what Romeo looks like. She doesn't know who he is yet. She's kind of approached this group of, of young men, so Romeo, Mercutio and Benvolio, and she's looking for Romeo. Then Romeo kind of takes the mick a little bit. I can tell you, but young Romeo will be older when you have found him than he was when you sought him. I am the youngest of that name, for fault of a worse. You say well. Yea, is the worst well, very well took in faith, wisely, wisely. If you be he, sir, I desire some confidence with you. She will indict him to some supper. Aboard, 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 so ho. What hast thou found? No hair, sir, unless a hair, sir, and a Lenten pie that is something stale and horror it be spent. And he walks by them and he, and he kind of sings his way off the stage here. An old hair whore, an old hair whore, is very good meat in Lent, but a hair that is whore is too much for a score when it whores ere it be spent. Romeo, will you come to your father's? Will to dinner hither, thither. Romeo says, I will follow you. Farewell, ancient lady. So he continues in this kind of rude behaviour to the nurse and he's singing lady lady as he leaves and exit Mercutio and Benvolio that a little bit. the nurse speaks to Romeo I pray you sir what saucy merchant was this that was so full of his ropery which means kind of roguery or knavery we've got the kind of description here bad behaviour a gentleman, nurse, that loves to hear himself talk and will speak more than a minute than he will stand to in a month. And if speak anything against me, I'll take him down and, and a were lustier than he is and twenty such jacks. And if I cannot, I'll find those that shall. Scurvy knave, I am none of his flirt gills. I am none of his skeins mates. She turns to Peter, her man. So Peter's there to kind of serve her. And thou must stand by too and suffer every knave to use me at his pleasure. So she starts to tell Peter off for kind of just standing there and not doing anything. But Peter kind of says, oh, I didn't really see anything happening. I saw no man use you at his pleasure. If I had, my weapon should quickly have been out, I warrant you. I dare draw as soon as another man, if I see occasion in a good quarrel and the law on my side. So we've got this kind of, um, this threat of violence here. This idea that a fight is brewing but nothing's happened yet. So Peter's not got involved to protect the nurse, but he could have done. If we think back to the prince's warning in Act 1, Scene 1, perhaps this is the reason for that. Now, afore God, I am so vexed that every part about me quivers. Scurvy knave. So she's angry. She's really angry with Mercutio's treatment of her. And she repeats this phrase, scurvy knave, which shows that Mercutio's not made a good impression. He's an unkind character here. He's not kind to the nurse, which kind of contrasts with what we know and what we think about Mercutio is that kind of high-energy entertainer. He's still high-energy, but is it starting to get a little bit darker here? She speaks to Romeo again. Pray you, sir, a word. And as I told you, my young lady bid me inquire you out. What she bid me say, I will keep to myself. But first, let me tell you, if you should lead her in a fool's paradise, as they say... It were a very gross kind of behaviour, as they say, for the gentlewoman is young, and therefore if you should deal double with her, truly it were an ill thing to be offered to any gentleman, and very weak dealing. What we've got here is this idea that um, she wants to protect Juliet. So she's saying to, um, to be serious about Juliet. She doesn't want Romeo to just be kind of um, some boy who's, you know, trying to get with Juliet for kind of a bit of a fling and a bit of a laugh. She wants him to be serious, so she's kind of cautioning him. And we could link this back into that kind of maternal behaviour that we saw in Act 1, Scene 3. Nurse, commend me to thy lady and mistress, I protest unto thee. Good hearth and in faith I will tell her as much. Lord, Lord, she will be a joyful woman. What wilt thou tell her, nurse, thou dost not mark me? I will tell her, sir, that you do protest, which, as I take it, is a gentleman-like offer. What we see now is a switch between the use of prose and the use of verse. So we start to talk again in poetic verse here. Um, as we start to discuss the marriage, we suggest that kind of love is a higher power. It's more important um, than the kind of trivial banter that we see in the start of the scene. It starts to get serious now, so we switch to the kind of formal verse. B 
bid her devise some means to come to shrift this afternoon, and there she shall at Friar Lawrence's cell be shrived and married. Here is for thy pains. No, truly, sir, not a penny. Go to, I say you shall. This afternoon, sir, well, she shall be there. And stay, good nurse, behind the abbey wall. Within this hour many, my man shall be with thee, and bring thee cords, mate, like a tackled stair. So he says, bring a rope ladder. Which to the high top gallant of my joy must be my convoy into the secret night. Farewell, be trusty, I'll quit thy pains. Farewell, commend me to thy mistress. So he says to bring this rope ladder so that he can get into Juliet's bedroom. You know, through the balcony. The nurse, now God in heaven bless thee, hark you, sir. What sayest thou, my dear nurse? Is your man secret? Did he ne'er hear say to make he counsel putting one away? So this idea that the man that Romeo is going to send, she wants to make sure that it's secretive, which highlights how their relationship is secretive and forbidden, which increases that plot tension. Everything's getting really tense. We've got that high energy and now that dark secretiveness. Warrant me, my man's as true as steel. We turn back to prose here as the nurse starts to ramble about Juliet again which suggests this kind of lack of importance. Well, sir, my mistress is the sweetest lady. Lord, Lord, when twas a little pratting thing. Oh, there is a noble woman, nobleman in town, one Paris that would fain lay knife abroad, but she, good soul, has had leave to see a, has leave see a toad, a very toad, as see him. I anger her sometimes and tell her that Paris is the properer man, but I'll warrant you, when I say so, she looks as pale as any clout in the versal world. Doth not Rosemary and Romeo both begin with a letter? So she tells Romeo here about Paris and how he wants to marry Juliet and she kind of says how she's been winding her up and saying that Paris is the proper or the more handsome man than Romeo. Um, but this idea that Juliet looks pale um, when she thinks about Paris, which is really important. We've got here a little bit of herbal symbolism. If we look down here, Rosemary, the herb of remembrance, worn at weddings and funerals. So this idea that this links Romeo with love and death in a symbolic way. I nurse what of that, both with an R. R Maka, that's the dog name. R is for the, no, I know it begins with some other letter and she had the prettiest sen sententious of it. You and Rosemary that it would do you good to hear it. Commend me to thy lady, I a thousand times. Peter, she calls for Peter, and on. She hands Peter her fan before and a pace. So they organize this meeting, they organize the wedding. It's all kind of gonna be done. She's gonna bring Juliet to the place. Here we've got this idea of a pace at the end, again intensifying those ideas of speed in the play. <laughs>